So here we go. I'm going to try and fit everything you need to know for engineering physics onto one piece of paper, virtually anyway. Let's start with rotational dynamics, that is the physics of spinny things. So I'm going to make a table here. So we have the actual rotational dimension. We have the linear equivalent because everything rotational has a linear equivalent and then everything works the same way. Symbol, unit and equation. Let's go for one of the most important ones, moment of inertia. The linear equivalent is mass because, well, I'll write this up in a bit. If mass is how hard it is to get something to move, then moment of inertia is how hard is it to get something to spin. Symbol is capital I, unit is kilogram meters squared. The only object you need to know the moment of inertia for is for a ring where all of the mass is at the radius. That's equal to mass times radius squared, so mr squared. For a disc, it ends up being half that. And then for all other ones, you'll of course be given what the equation is in the exam if needed. We have torque, which is the equivalent of force. Symbol is capital T, can be a tau actually. The unit is newton meters, because it's a moment, we call it in AQA, but not in engineering. This is one of the most important things in this table because it's our jumping off point. So we go from linear mechanics into rotational mechanics. Torque is equal to I alpha, moment of inertia times angular acceleration, but it's also equal to force times the distance from the pivot. We know this from moments, don't we? So that's why I put a star next to it. Very, very important. You can bet your bottom dollar that in pretty much 95% of all rotational questions, you're going to have to use the fact that torque is equal to both of these. Then we go into our bog standard ones. We have the rotational equivalents of displacement, velocity, and acceleration, given by theta, omega, and alpha. It's not meters per second. No, it's radians and radians per second, radians per second squared. That's fairly easy. Angular velocity being rate of change of angular displacement, etc. Angular momentum, given the symbol capital L, it's unit, not too important, but it's kilogram meter squared per second. And normal momentum is mass times velocity. So in this case, it's going to be moment of inertia times angular velocity. Work done is also a thing in rotational. It's still joules. If it's force times distance for linear, then it's torque times angular displacement for rotational, so T theta. Power, similarly, we just take the work done equation, divide by time. And so we end up with T omega instead. Ignoring the EK for now, let's go for rotational suvat. All of Newton's equations of motion apply to rotational. We just need to swap out the symbols. So S becomes theta, U becomes omega 1, V becomes omega 2, A becomes alpha. Time is still time, of course, though. The kinetic energy of a spinning object is equal to half I omega squared, just like half MV squared, but for rotational. Now we have this classic question here where we have a mass that is falling and it's on a string and it's making this wheel or pulley spin. They love asking you a question about this. And so all we can say in this case is that the GPE lost by the mass is being turned into the kinetic energy of the mass, of course, but also kinetic energy of the wheel. And possibly if there's friction, then the work done due to friction, the work done against friction as well with the wheel. So we can say MGH for the mass is equal to half MV squared for the mass plus half I omega squared for the wheel. And then if there is friction, then we can say that's plus T theta. Torque due to friction times the angular displacement, of course, in radians. Seen this crop up a couple of times when we have angular momentum coupling. If you have two things that are spinning and then they come into contact and they end up going at a common speed, angular speed, that is. Just like a collision in linear mechanics, we know that total angular momentum is going to be conserved even if energy is lost. And so that means it's going to be inelastic, doesn't it? Which is fairly normal, but we might not clock that. So we can say angular momentum of one plus the angular momentum of two equals the angular momentum of both of them together afterwards. Fairly easy. We're just applying our conservation of momentum rules in linear to rotational mechanics instead. Okay, let's go on to thermodynamics. Here's the first law of thermodynamics. Q is equal to U. We might call it delta U plus W. Q is heat supplied to a gas. It's negative if heat is removed. U or delta U is the change in internal energy. That's of course proportional to temperature. So that means it's negative if it cools. And W was work done by gas. A gas needs to expand if it's going to do work. Just like if you do work with the force, you actually have to move something. You can't just push against a solid wall that doesn't move. And we know that's equal to P delta V. More on that in a bit. So we can rejig this equation for different situations. We have adiabatic situations where the heat transfer is zero. No heat is going in or out of the gas. That means that the change in internal energy is equal to the work done. You do need to be careful with minuses and pluses when using this equation. Very important. So we have PV gamma is equal to a constant. So that means PV to the gamma equals PV to the gamma. 
gamma being the adiabatic constant. That's going to be different for every gas. You're always going to be given that in a question. Isothermal, constant temperature. So that means that U is going to be zero, no change in internal energy. That means all of the heat going in is being transferred to work. So Q is equal to W. So that means, like you've seen in thermal, PV equals PV. Constant volume, we might call that isochoric, but you won't see that in the exams. No work done because there's no change in volume. So that means Q is equal to U. All of that heat is being used to raise the temperature of the gas. So P over T equals P over T. Isobaric, constant pressure probably will just see constant pressure not isobaric in an exam. Change in pressure is zero, so therefore V over T equals V over T, which of course we know is Charles's law. We can draw a PV diagram to show what's happening with gases. If we have an indicator diagram, then we can show what happens to a gas as we compress it, put heat in, take heat out. Now the area under any line on a PV graph is equal to work done by or work done on a gas. It just depends whether it's being compressed or if it's expanding. So that means the area enclosed in a loop in an indicator diagram is equal to the net work out per cycle. That is providing that it is actually the gas doing net work, not us doing net work on a gas. Incidentally, I forgot to add up here, if a gas is changing isothermally, that means P is inversely proportional to V, so we have this curve, of course. But if the temperature increases for a gas in this situation, then that means that the curve will get further away from the origin, the hotter it is. So a heat engine is the name that we give to any device that causes network to be done by a gas by adding heat. Of course, we use these in cars. So an auto cycle is the diagram that can be used to show what happens inside of a petrol engine. Of course, we have a piston in a cylinder. First, we compress the gas and then we add in heat. That is done by the fuel and air mixture combusting thanks to the spark plug setting it off. That puts heat into the gas, but then the piston's allowed to move and we have the power stroke. That's what then drives the wheels, essentially. And of course, we have heat out then, don't we? As we exhaust the spent gases, because they're no use anymore. Now, for an auto cycle, you don't need to add in then the extra exhaust and intake strokes for when we get rid of those gases and then take in fresh air and fuel. Diesel engine, slightly different. Yes, we compress it, but then we don't have a spark plug. The air is heated and that just ignites the fuel as it's injected into the cylinder. And so the top part and the curvy part going down, they're both parts of the power stroke. And so because we have this bigger area in a diesel PV loop, that means we have more work done by the gas per cycle. That's why diesel is slightly more expensive because you do get more miles out of diesel than you do out of petrol, ultimately, pound for pound. Straddling the gap between rotational and thermodynamics, flywheels are needed to smooth out torque in an engine. The lumpy torque results from the whole thing that linear motion is converted into rotational motion. Here's a torque angle diagram to show what the torque is like during one cycle of a piston doing its four strokes in an engine. We can see the power stroke there, can't we? And if we didn't have a flywheel, then we'd just be jerking along the road. So that's why we need a flywheel to smooth out that torque. Flywheels, of course, store kinetic energy. Okay, let's talk about more conceptual things regarding engines then. We can have an energy flow diagram. Any engine requires heat to go in, we can call that Q in or QH actually. That comes from a hot source in a petrol and diesel engine. That comes from the actual combustion of the gases, of course. We have some work that is done as a result of that, but not all of that heat that goes in can be converted into work. So some of that heat has to come out. We say that goes to a cold sink. In an engine's case, that heat goes out with the spent gases that go out the exhaust. And it's impossible for our Q in or QH to be equal to the work done. If that was the case, we'd have the perfect engine. And that would go against the second law of thermodynamics. It's not possible to convert heat continuously into work without at the same time transferring some heat from a warmer body to a colder body. In other words, no engine can be 100% efficient. Let's talk about efficiency then. The maximum theoretical efficiency is going to be equal to that work done divided by QH or Q in. Just be careful with your Q in, AQA, like Q in, not QH. So you will see that in your exams. Q in is always at the top and that's always next to the hot source, Q out or QC is always next to the cold sink or the cold area, cold object. And that's the case even for heat pumps and fridges, which we'll see in a minute. We can rewrite the efficiency equation as QH minus QC over QH, of course, because work done is just the difference between the two heats. And because the heat is proportional to the temperature, we can replace our Qs with Ts as well. Just make sure that you're in Kelvin, not in degree C. Doesn't make a difference for the top, but it does for the bottom of the equation. But let's talk about the actual real life 
efficiencies that we have in an engine. First, we need to know what the input power is. That's the power from burning the fuel. Indicated power, that's obtained from our work done. That's our PV loop. But then we need to times that by how many times that happens per second, how many cycles per second, times by the number of cylinders in the car as well. Usually three, four, six, could be eight if you've got a souped up supercar. Then we have the brake power. That's just the output power right at the end of the engine. Okay, our different efficiencies then. Mechanical efficiency is equal to the brake power, the output power that is divided by the indicated power. So basically, once we've actually done what we need to do with the gas, so that's when we're going to be losing energy due to friction. We have thermal efficiency. Maybe you should have put this above. Whatever, we have the indicated power divided by the input power. Not all of the energy from burning the fuel is going to actually be used to do the work on the piston. We have the overall. We just go from the beginning to the end, it's the output power, the brake power divided by the input power. Don't forget that at this point, we don't put efficiencies in percentages. That's why I don't have a times 100 there. Heat pumps and refrigerators, they do the opposite to an engine. Instead of us getting work out, we do work on a gas to get energy out. I've put Q out, but it's not quite as simple as that. You'll see why. So here we have an energy flow diagram again. The thing is now is that we're putting in work and we're getting heat from a cold source, as it were, and we're forcing it into a hot sink. They're not called that, but you can see that we're actually taking the heat from the bottom to the top this time. Now with a heat pump, we're interested in how much energy we're actually able to force into a already warmer place. So for instance, you're getting cold air from the outside of your window, let's say, outside of your house, and you're putting work in and you're making it hotter and you're forcing it inside where it's already warmer. We need to know how efficient it is, quote unquote, so we don't have efficiency, but we have coefficient of performance or COP. It's just going to be the other way around to efficiency. So it's going to be QH for a heat pump divided by the work done. And of course, we can replace it with Qs and also Ts as well. But it is going to be QH for a heat pump. For a fridge, however, we're interested in how much energy we're able to take out of the cold space. So therefore, it's going to be QC on top. And hopefully you can see that all coefficient of performances are going to be greater than one. The higher, the better. Yeah, we can say that the more efficient it is, but we don't really say that. We say that the higher the COP, the more heat you get out relative to the work that you put in. Heat pumps are better because yes, even though we use electricity to drive the heat pump, it's more efficient than actually just using electrical energy to heat a coil or electric heater or something. Lastly, they love asking questions about this combined heat and power plant or scheme or something like that. What we can do is have an engine that drives a generator, so we get electricity out of that, but then also some of that work is being used to drive a heat pump as well. It's more efficient than just using electricity to heat, so that's why we do it. This is usually what the energy flow diagram looks like for this. We have our engine on the left, and we have some of that work going to a generator to make electricity, but then some of that work going to the heat pump on the right. And so actually, if you have this, then you can use the heat out of the engine and you can also use the heat out of the heat pump to heat your room or your surroundings. If you think there's something I missed, then let me know. But the most important thing with engineering physics is having a go at questions. So make sure that you're practicing as many questions as you can. Just be very careful with putting down what your variables are. There's lots of different Qs, lots of different Ts, etc. It's very easy to just mix up one thing and then get the whole of the question wrong. So it is all about being as diligent and conscientious as you can be with your workings. All the best.